let's not do a professional intro because I can't think of one. But Craig, coach of Batley Bulldogs, thank you for joining us ahead of the uh, 2022 season. Boring question you've probably been asked about a million times already. How's everything looking at the Bulldogs ahead of this uh, brand new year? Yeah, positive. Um, pre-season's gone, I suppose, as well as it, it could do leading up to Christmas. Then we have the uh, the cancellation of the Boxing Day game with due to a COVID outbreak. But you you look at the the silver lining on that is that we've got sixteen or seventeen players that have now had COVID and they're not tested for the next three months. So you know, coming into the coming into the the, the main season, um, you know, we've, we should we should be uh, fairly COVID free for the first. First three months, you know, so that's the that's a positive we can take out of it. But pre pre Christmas, we had a good six weeks uh, pre season. Um, did have a, a massive amount of turnover of players, so it meant they could come back a little bit later. We finished a little bit later due to the fact that we got to the semi final last year, so you know, giving a little bit a little bit longer off in terms of uh, the, the, the turnaround. So we managed to get six week in before that that Boxing Day game, but obviously that was cancelled, and uh, you know, we're, we're back to the last couple of weeks now before the first game against Halifax. So. You know, we're happy with where we are at the minute, but you know that might change come two or three weeks into the season. You you played witness on uh, Sunday. What what did you uh, get out of that one? It was another good another good learning curve for us. You know, uh, it's witness and another team that you expect to be in and around there in the division that we're fighting for. As Bradford probably are as well. You know, so we had a good contest against Bradford the week before. Another really good contest against Witness. I thought Witness looked really good. They were very, very, very tough, very fit, very strong, and they looked dangerous for them when they when they had the ball around as well. You know, so it was a good reminder for us that you know the teams that are going to be around us are going to be challenging. You've got to be on your you've got to be on your metal every single week, and that's how close the championship is going to be. You know, so it's, a, it's, it's a good learning curve for us. I said pre all the games at pre season, I'm not bothered if we, if we win every game or lose every game because they don't they don't really mean a great deal in terms of league points on the ladder, but it gives you. It gives you an idea of where you are with balling and defensive and also fitness wise as well. You know, so it's 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 given us a good good yardstick of where we are. Uh, one more friendly this week against Huddersfield, which will be again another tough friendly for us, but it'll hopefully stand us in good stead come the Halifax game on the thirtieth. In terms of you mentioned COVID and the effect that it's it's had, um, have you had any issues with long COVID? Are you having to look after the players a little bit more? Um, I don't know, more concern over how you bring them back into the, the environment and, and what they can and can't do? Not, not particularly, no. We've got this, we've got this seven day return to, return to play protocol anyway, so they've got to go through that staged, that staged return uh, so they can do certain things after day one, day two, day three. Some of the players are, are a bit frustrated because of, they'll, they'll tell you they've been well ever they've had COVID, some of them have had, they've had no symptoms, so they've been training fully well, they've been isolating at home. Then they come back to the club, and you and you you basically regress them back to uh, back to stage one to uh, twenty minutes worth of really light work on, on a on a on a static bike, and they're frustrated. Some of them because they want to go further because you're taking them back. But it's it's common sense, isn't it? and some some players if they get a little bit short of breath, then you take them back a stage. You know, we're not as a, as a club and the medical staff. We won't let any players go uh, above and beyond what they can do physically. Um, and, some players have had no symptoms at all. Some players have taken a little bit longer than us to, to get back to full training. Um, so it's a little bit common sense. And, you know, we're, we're guided by the player and also the medical staff. That, uh, you know, they'll let us know where each player is in, in, in regards to when they can train fully and when they can't train. And, and what are your plans with loans and dual reg this year? Because, again, there's been quite a lot of talk that if COVID is going to be an issue, if games are going to be awarded 48 nil. that there might be a little need to stockpile greater squads perhaps at Super League level. Do you think that's going to have an effect on championship clubs? Um, I don't think it'll have an impact on us particularly. Uh, dual reg, we won't, we won't do a dual reg. We, you know, we're, we're badly, we just seem to be an attractive club for Super League clubs to dual register. We, you know, we've, we've, been, uh, we've, been, we've been a solvent club for over 25 years and we pay, pay everybody uh, on time and pay what pay what they're owned and it's a good family club. Uh, we'll look after the players, we'll look after the supporters, but that's not enough for us to get a, an attractive dual reg uh, partnership with anybody. But we'll keep trying. Um, in respect of loans, uh, we'll we'll give our, our players who've done pre-season uh, the first shot at it. If we need to strengthen, if we need to look at the market outside of that, then we'll do that. But I think uh, most of the league clubs will be looking at the reserve competition first and seeing what sort of standard that is. If the standard dips in that, I would imagine that Super League clubs will want their players going out and playing top end championship or at least at least championship level rugby. Um, but I, I think we'll, we need to look at what the standard of the reserve comp is going to be first before we see 
any uh, if any players come do come down uh, come become available for loan. I think if the comp- competition in reserve is is good and it's competitive, then they might want to keep the players there. But outside of that, if it if it's a lot of a lot of academy players that are filling the reserve teams, they might want their players who are out of playing championship or league one rugby to get some first team experience. The other thing I, I suspect, um, and you've very kindly written about this in in our latest magazine, is the championship this year again looks like the most competitive of the three divisions. And that when you were going through looking at the uh, respective challenges, probably what would you say six, seven, maybe even eight of the teams in the division got a realistic chance to think that yeah, they may just be up there come playoff time and pushing for promotion. Definitely, yeah, and, and, and I don't think you can discount anybody. You know, you look at look at last season. I suppose we were a surprise package being up there where we were. You look at Whitehaven. I think uh, if you look at the tail season previous, I think Whitehaven lost all their games. Um, you know, so I suppose they were they were the um, pundits' favourites to maybe go down, but they they shocked everybody. You know, they, they recruited really well. They really smartly uh, brought some brought some flair in on the on the edges, and I think Louis Gilfre helped them as well. You know, so. You got what you always got from Whitehaven, which were a really tough doggy, doggy pack in the middle unit, but they also had some spark and some some excitement on the edges as well. So yeah, I think if anybody gets on a bit of a roll, you, you saw that with us last year, we've got a little bit of confidence, we've got on a roll, we, we rode the crest of the wave a little bit, and it's once you get onto that and that habit of winning, it's hard to get out of a little bit like losing. If you start start picking up three or four losses on, on the bounce, it's difficult to get out of and you sometimes lose that close games that you would ordinarily ordinarily win, and vice versa if you if you on a bit of good form, you'll win them close games that you might, have, might ordinarily lose. So I don't think you can discount anybody this year. I think the majority of teams uh, in the championship have all, on paper they've all they've all strengthened. You know, you look at the, the quality of the players that have, have joined uh, the championship this year, some that have dropped down from Super League level, and it's it's you know, it's, it's mouthwatering some of the clashes that you that you can uh, you can see coming up this year. And you, you, I suppose that the top two on paper are going to be Featherstone and Lee. You know, so the, the players that they've signed as well, they're, they're pretty much Super League squads by all the state has been in the championship. So it's a really exciting, exciting division, exciting competition this year. Well, it's not just the players who are coming into the competition. You, you get to pick your wits <laughs> against Brian McDermott at Featherstone, who's won up team grand finals with Leeds and, and Adrian Lamb at Lee, who was in the grand final just two years ago. It's, a, it's an amazing turnaround in terms of the coaching facility, uh, coaching uh, it, uh, appointment. It is. It is, yeah. And I think that's the, the attraction now of the championship. It shows that there's life outside the Super League. And then I think anybody who watched the, the playoff games, the, you know, the really tough, close, uh, close playoff games, um, very, very competitive and, and you know, these life away from Super League. The Super League isn't the be all and end all, and it's a different game. It's a different competition. We're not expected to compete with uh, the Super League teams. It's not the same product. It is a different. It is a different product. But just because it's different doesn't mean say it's worse. And I think it's uh, the same with League One as well. League One's a different competition to what Championship and Super League is. You know, so you've got you've got a, a different brand of game all the way all the way down the structures. And there's there's some really attractive games in every single division that you play this year. Um, I suppose the the challenge to the to the guys coming down from Super League is can they adapt to playing at, at places like a, a Workington and a Whitehaven and a Batley and a Jewsbury and they've not got the the, the grounds that you're playing at your St Helens, your Wiggins and places like that week in week out. You know, so it's that, that's going to be the challenge for them guys to adapt to um, because it is a different competition. It's, it's a championship. It, it takes a different sort of person to uh, to adapt and, and, and compete at the championship level week in week out. You mentioned the club's been solvent for 25 years. It's obviously well run. How does that uh, impact on you as a, as a coach? It, it must make life uh, a lot easier that you're not having to worry about your players coming to you uh, wanting that they're not getting paid on time. Yeah, it's, you, you know, Kevin Nicholas, who's been the chairman now uh, since 1998, I think it is. He's, he's looked, looked after the club. He's put the club in a, a really good financial position. You know, we're not a rich club, but we don't owe anybody any money. The ground's our own. Um, you know, so any, any money that comes through the gates, any functions that we have at the club, it's it's money that goes back to the club and not not go back to the council or the landlord of the ground. You know, so we're we're in a really good position uh, that we don't owe any money. Uh, we're not, so we're not we're not a rich club by any means. And I suppose as a coach, it's frustrating at times that you, you look at the the budget that we've got to spend, the playing budget that we've got to spend, and it's probably down in, in the in, in the bottom quarter of the division, um, which can be frustrating at times when there's certain players that you might want to go out there and get, uh, but you haven't got the money to spend it, so you're not going to put the club into any, any financial danger. As I said, we know that every player and every member of staff is going to get paid on time and get what they're, get what they're owed every single, every single month of the year, and that's 
I think that's better uh, to pay people what you can rather than promise people and not, not be able to pay them at the end of the month. Um, and I think with that as well, people who sign for Batley know what our what our pay structure is. You know, So anybody who's coming to Batley, they know what the pay structure is, they know what sort of club it is. So it's got to be the right individual that comes to a club like Batley. They've got to, they've got to be hard work and they've got to be honest, they've got to be humble and they've got to buy into the family feel of the club because everybody's involvement at a club like Batley matters, whether it's the, the programme seller, whether it's a car park attendant, the person who's making the tees, uh, the kit man, the director, the players, the coaches, everybody's input matters. And, and that's what that's why a club like Batley is really successful and, and people like coming to Batley. You touched on something as well about there's more players now dropping down to a part-time level um, and that might be a bigger issue for the game as a whole. Should, should we be concerned about that? It's fantastic that we're going to see some uh, you know, players like Nene McDonald and Joey Leilu are playing in the Championship, but there are quite a few Super League players who've decided to play part-time these days. Yeah, I think, it's, I think the, the game's maybe a little bit of a crossroads and everybody needs to decide where it's going to go. Uh, you're seeing a lot of players that are mid, mid to late 20s now that, that are dropping out of, out of the Super League game because they're not making the money that's that's going to make them financially secure to retire when, once they finish playing. You know, we're not we're not playing Premier League or Championship football where people are earning thousands and thousands of pounds a week. So when they get to 32, 33 year old and they're, and they're dropping out of the full time full time game, they've, they've got another career. They've got, they've, they've got to find another way to make money. And I think some people now are making the real, getting the realization that at 32, 33 year old, if you've not made enough money to, to retire, you've then got to start working. And it might be in a job that you're earning eighteen thousand pound or twenty thousand pound a year, which it's not great. But if you can if you can join a job, get a job now that's earning that you're earning twenty grand a year, twenty two grand a year, as well as earning a lot, earning some decent money playing part time rugby, you can earn more money than playing full time rugby. You know, so that benefits a part time part time game, the championship and League One. But for the strength and depth of the game and the future of the professional game in, in England, I think it's pretty worrying. Um, hopefully the the TV deal now where we're getting some free-to-air games on Channel 4, it might increase the, the attendances in terms of the, the, the viewing figures and maybe increase a little bit, increase a little bit of uh, interest in the game, which might then give us a little bit more TV money for uh, for the next next Sky deal or whatever comes in, whether it's, whether it's going to be a, a streaming company or the BBC or Channel 4 or Channel 5, whatever it might be. You know, so we, we need to get that get the game out there, which is it's happening this year. You know, there's a lot of a lot of games uh, being going to be streamed this year, whether it's Championship, Super League, or League One. I think that's going to be really important for us to secure a, a real good financial package next time around. One of the uh, people who will be showing games is um, Premier Sports. You'll you'll be on Monday nights. Your competition and your good selves will be seen as well. Uh, good thing for the Championship. Yeah, I think it is. As, as I said before, I think the championship's a really good product. And the more people see it, the more people it, 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 it can hopefully attract. And you know, even even Super League Super League clubs, if they're not playing, can we get their supporters to come and watch us on a, on a Monday night? Um, you know, that's what that's what we want to do. and try and get as many people there as we can. Um, and I know people say it's, it's not it's not a cracking night in Monday night because people have got to work on a Monday and then go and play rugby, then work on a on a Tuesday morning, but. I don't care. You know, I'll, I'll play at midnight on Tuesday night if I have to. If, if it gets if it gets a game out there so people can watch it, we'll make we'll make them sacrifice so people can can uh, can watch games because uh, that's what it needs. We need we need people watching the championship. We need people watching as much rugby league as we possibly can. Obviously, the championship is is the bread and butter, but we've seen four teams now over the past few years get to Wembley in the eighteen ninety five cup. How important would that be to the club to have a run to Wembley? Uh, it's been a while since Batley you've been there. Yeah, well, we'd not be there this year, would we? Because it's a Tottenham, so we won't be there this year. If, if we got there. <laughs> We're all about that. <laughs> well, you can't make it to Tottenham, yeah. Yeah, we'll, well, we'll, we'll go to Wendell. Maybe, maybe somebody else is playing at Tottenham. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I really like the 1895 Cup. I like the idea of it because it, it gives the teams outside of Super League. Because realistically, who outside Super League now is going gonna, is gonna to get to a Challenge Cup final, you know, with, it, with the exception of. Uh, of Leo are full time now, and, and, and Featherstone, who have got the, the players that they've got, you wouldn't really expect anybody else to 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 make a serious challenge to get to uh, to a, a Challenge Cup final. So I think anything that gives the players and the coaches and the fans the the, the opportunity to get to a big occasion, you know, where we're going to grasp that with both hands. You know, it's something that we're we're certainly going to go out and try try to aim for. We're not going to use it as a as an extended preseason friendly like some clubs might do. Um, we're going to use it as a competition that's that, that's there to win, you know. So hopefully we can we can 
you know, we could do ourselves justice in that. And if we do, then who knows, we might we get to a final. And, and the summer bash is back this year, not, not in Blackpool as it's been before, but but at Headingley, so a bit, bit less uh, travel for, for, for Batley. But how much are you looking forward to that being back on the calendar? Yeah, I think it's again. I think it's a good. I think it's a good, uh, a good day or a good weekend there to to, to promote the, the the championship rugby. You know, it's, it's, it get all the games on, on on TV on a on a weekend, and it's uh, it, it's something else there for fans to see that's different to watching Super League week week in week out. And yeah, it's not a Blackpool, but it's another. It's, it's a it's a field. It's a rugby field, isn't it? It's, it's a game of rugby that we've got to win. That's you know first and foremost. That's what we're we're concentrating on is trying to get two league points and. Uh, you know, if we can get a lot of people there in the ground and let them have a good day and you know the rugby league can promote it and, and get a lot of people there, then the atmosphere gets better and, and players want to play in front of big crowds. You know, so hopefully we can get a lot of people in there and, and the players can experience playing in front of a few a few thousand people more than what they would do normally. And just going back a little to the, the value of the 1895 Cup, I mean one of the great successes for for the Bulldogs in recent times was winning the Northern Rail. Um how much did that mean to the club? How much did it trade on the back of that? What sort of civic pride was there for the town as a whole? And, and how important was it to, to get you to where you are today as a stable championship side? I think um, in, in respect to getting us where we are financially, I don't, I don't think the club maybe gained a lot out of it financially, um, but it's, it's, it's the day out and it's a success that clubs like, like Batley don't normally get. Um, it, and, and that's what the 1895 Cup will bring to clubs like us. That you've got the you've got the opportunity to have your day in the sun, and, and the you know the people like like Kevin Nicholas, who's been involved in the club for years and years and years, uh, who, are, who are a supporter of the club from being a kid. So it's not just some it's not just something he's done since 1998. It's, it's been his life. You know, so the the reward that people the personal reward, reward and gratification for, for somebody like Kevin. That's put a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort into the club. It's it's just it's reward for people like that and the supporters that have followed home and away through thick and thin. And you know, particularly with Batley, we've not over recent years, apart from the uh, the Northern Rail Cup and the Transpennine Cup in 1998. You know, the days in the sun are few and far between. So it's you know, for a club like us, for a small club like us, it's it's massive to have these sort of days. And that's why we'll we'll be doing everything we can in the 1895 Cup to try and get to that final because you know. For the supporters and the people that, 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 that put a lot of time and effort into the club, it's invaluable to keep them involved and keep them interested and just reward them, really. I guess one of the other things is a phrase that's been banded a lot by the RFL moving forward is return on investment, which isn't just about how you perform on the field. Um, Batley are a classic example of that. Your, your role in the community is, is massive, and, and I know that you do a lot of stuff behind the scenes as well as coaching the first team. Um, Batley means a hell of a lot as a club to the people of that town. It does, yeah. There's, you know, I think if you go back maybe five or six years, and I think the club maybe realised a little bit that we've got a facility up there that's, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, 95 percent of the week it's not used. So we wanted to try and get it out there to the community and use it. And there's, there's, there's lots of different groups that come up, come up there now. You know, we have uh, you know special education these kids that, that come up and, and they do the cooking up there, and you've got. Um, coffee mornings and memories, memories clubs and other community group, groups that use the gym and all, all sorts of stuff that go on up at the club now. So there's always something going on at the club. And as you say, it plays a vital part in the, in the local community and integrating different people from different cultures and different faiths and trying to work together and all the stuff that's really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a focus in society at this moment in time. It's all going on at the club. Uh, and we, I suppose, I suppose as a club, and for the uh, your return on investment, we're not necessarily rewarded for that because a lot of your return on investment is how many Twitter followers that you get, and how many Facebook followers you've got, and how many things on social media go on. You know, so it's not necessarily something that I suppose as a club we're particularly great at because again we, we're relying on, on on volunteers and and, and club directors that do all that sort of stuff. We've we don't employ a media person because we've, we've not got the money to do that. So, you know, I suppose we're a little bit behind the times in respect of how we promote the club. And we, yeah, we could do it a little bit better. I guess everybody can do that a little bit better. And yeah, it's something that we, because we we really could look at other clubs, you know, like, like York. York have done really well over the last few years in promoting the, promoting the club and promoting the games and promoting the, you know, the club to the people of the, of the city of York. And, you know, something that they've done exceptional over the last few years but as I said where we are at the, the minute financially and as a club we, we don't employ a, a full-time or part-time media manager all done part-time with other people around the full-time jobs you know so 
Um, yeah, return on investment on that, on that side of things we can maybe improve, but we're doing what we can with the local community and the amount of people that come into the into the club now during the week that haven't got an involvement in rugby league or there's no uh, you know, the, the actual activity that's going on up there during the day is nothing to do with rugby league. It's quite large now, so that's something that the club can be proud of. Well, we talked about you know dual registration in terms of players and, and learning places. Is that something else where perhaps Super League could help in terms of? Infrastructure off the field. I, I don't. Know, I don't want to put more work on Super League club media people. I know they get everything thrown on them. That has nothing to do with their job. But is that something where perhaps the sport could do a little bit more for clubs like yourself who don't have the money there to to spend on people to do uh, exciting graphics on social media or whatever? No, I don't. I don't think so. No, I think I think it's each, each club's individual responsibility to do that themselves. You know, and we don't we don't want to rely on handouts and, that, and, and as a club, it's what we need to do better. You know, so we don't want to be relying on on Leeds Rhinos media giving us giving us some free work. It's something that we've got to do. We've got to develop as a club, and and we're we're trying to we're trying to get bigger, we're trying to get better, trying to trying to raise more money. Um, and again, looking at different things that are going on at, at, at the ground is uh, we've, we've got we've got permission from the council this year to to hold, hold some concerts up there. There's a beer festival that's going to be going on there. So we're looking at as a club at, at different ways to get different people. To the club that aren't involved in rugby league, because you know, this, I don't believe there's a great deal of money in rugby league now. So we need to attract finance from from other areas. And and what we've got up there, like I said, we've, we've got our own ground up there. We're, we're not reliant on the council. We're not reliant on landlords giving us permission to do stuff at the ground. It's up to us to do that. And as a club, that's what we're trying to do this year. We're trying to expand the things that we do. Um, and hopefully, if we could do that, then the finance financial situation might get better. And it might mean that we can employ more people at the club to do stuff day to day, which then means it can, can, uh, can promote the club better on social media. So I'm, I'm certainly not an advocate of, of getting handouts from other clubs. I think we need to take that responsibility ourselves and look after ourselves as a business. I guess the million dollar question for a club like Batley is that if you did win the million pound game, the question would no doubt be raised, would you want to be in Super League? I would imagine your players, you as a coaching staff, that's your ambition. That That's why you do it. Um, would it would it be the kind of death knell that some clubs in the Premier League in football have suffered that they've sort of touched the sun and then it's it's burned them really badly? Do you still want to be a Super League club or do you need to consolidate what you are and and and, and the place you've got in your community? It's a little bit of both. We need to consolidate. You know, first and foremost, what we need to do this season is try and maintain that top six position as a minimum. Uh, I think every time, and I've mentioned this previously, every time that Batley have had a good season over the last 10 years, the best players have been cherry picked to them. It's, it's, it's effectively starting again. You know, we've not we've not done that this year. We've managed to retain everybody we want to retain, with the exception of one player. You know, so we're in a good position in respect of our playing squad. So there's no excuse why we can maintain what we did last year. I know everybody else has improved, uh, but, but so have we. I think we've improved on paper. So there's no reason why we can't do it again. Um, but again, you go back to it financially, what we've paid and what other clubs have paid, where we're probably a long way behind what other clubs have spent financially. But just because you spend money doesn't automatically guarantee your success. Um, so if we can maintain that consistency and and develop that winning that winning mentality in the club, and we can we can maintain being a top six, top four club, and we get to the point where we're challenging for promotion and we, and we do get up, then of course we go up. You know, but what we won't do then is we won't, we won't throw a lot of money at people that generally go from relegate a club to newly promote a club because then all you get then is you get the dual forget team that's going to get relegated, relegated again the season after. What we do and, and what we said to the players this year or what, what Kevin said to the players this year was well, if, if we did go up we'd, we'd probably go to some sort of uh, dual role hybrid sort of uh, sort of club where we, anybody who wanted to stay at the club and play in Super League on a part-time basis would do that. We'd obviously have to look around for some full-time players but we certainly wouldn't be spending 1.5 million on people that have uh, that are floating around different clubs that go from relegate a club to promote a club and and, and, and I see you in the same situation then. And the likelihood is if we did that the first year, we'd come straight back down again. But we'd be in a better financial position the year after to, again to to have a better squad to compete in champ in the championship to get promoted again this, get again the year after and maintain some sort of consistency and some stability. Uh, and then who knows within two or three years and we might be able to get that in that position to to maintain a Super League side, but you know, these are all dreams. You know, I'll probably wake up when I'm talking about this in a few minutes' time. But you know, these these are all dreams you want to aspire to. And why not? You know, we don't want to be a championship team forever. We're not going to be a League One team. You know, we want to be as high as, as high as we possibly can. 
as you said, players want to play at the highest level. I, me as a coach, I want to coach at the highest level. And the club wants to be at the highest level it possibly can be. And if that's if that's Supling, then why not? You've got a lot of um, strong community clubs as well, either in or around the town. Is the Bulldogs still a, a pull for, for those players? It's, it's difficult now with, with, with the lack of um, lack of, of, of reserve team structure because it's, it's not, there's not many people that you can get that come from the amateur game or that want to come from the, from the amateur game because people play the amateur, the amateur game now because it's, it's, it's what they want to do. You know, there's, there's not that, that consistency or that uh, that commitment where you're training three times a week and then playing on the weekend because if somebody comes from the amateur game, they're going to do it on a page of play basis. But for them to for them to be able to play, they're going to have to train three times a week. Um, and there's not always the commitment from the players to do that. And you can understand that. Whereas if it were if there were a reserve team structure, you could they could they could uh, again maybe dual uh, effectively dual reg with an amateur club, so they could continue playing with an amateur club, but also come and play with the reserve at the same time. So you could you could have a look at them in a, in a sort of semi professional environment and see if they could be could, could be good for the first team. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a massive advocate advocate for for reserve team rugby. If it weren't for reserve team rugby, I'd, I'd never played the first team game. You know, I, I came through the reserve team structure. And a lot of players did that at, at, at the time that, that went on to play in excess of 200 games for the club. You know, so the, the reserve team structure does work. But unfortunately, where we are at the, the moment as, as, as a game, we can't. We're not allowed to have a reserve team uh, as we used to have the reserve team. Now, there's that many things we've got to put in place now to develop the players that, again, financially, we're not in that situation where we can spend that sort of money. Um, so players coming from, from the amateur game now, unless they're absolutely outstanding and they're willing to come and do a pre-season for nothing and give it a go, there's very few players that are going to come from the amateur game into the pro game. And for people outside of the heavy woolen districts, because obviously... <laughs> I used to, I used to, I used, I used to work in Batley. I mean, work is a, a, a strong word for what I used to do. But I, I earned some money working in Batley. How, uh, how important is it that obviously Hull and the Hull FC, Hull FC and Hull Care, they want to finish above each other. Work is in a wide area. Well, how important is it that you finish above Dewsbury this year? I'm not bothered. I finish above as long as we finish as high as possible. Can if that means we finish above Dewsbury, then, then brilliant. Um, I think the. I think the bragging rights in the, in, in the local derby now it's 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 not as I don't know it's not as high as it used to be I don't think I think because they've played each other that many times over, over recent years it's lost that intensity you know I, I go back to when I when I first played when I first first came into came into the first team and Jewsbury were were riding high in the championship and I think they won, they won the division two or three times through that that really good sort of championship team the division one team that Jewsbury had at the time. And I can remember we played them on a Friday night and we won 14-12 and it was the first time that Batley had won uh, being used in a number of years. And it was, you know, the, the euphoria that we had then as, as, as a group of players were, were fantastic. But you've gone through years where you've played each other five, six, seven times and that, that intensity of the, of the derby game, for some reason, it's, it's, it's sort of diminished now. Um, so I don't think there's that intense rivalry that used to be there between the two, the two teams. So I'm not particularly bothered with that. As long as we finish as high as we possibly can, whether we're above Jewsbury or below Jewsbury, I'm not particularly bothered. Um, obviously, it's, it's nice for the fans and it's nice for uh, for the directors to finish the above your local rivals. But I think for for rugby league in the local area to thrive, both teams have got to be doing well. You know, so I don't want to see Jewsbury relegated. I'm sure Jewsbury don't want to see us relegated when you in the grand scheme of things because about the Jewsbury game, it's it's still a lot of I suppose I'm contradicting myself a little bit. In this regard, but it's still a good a good game to have in the in, in the calendar of a championship game. Um, you know, I, I do think we we watered down a little bit with the amount of times we play each other. You know, we play each other on a box day, and there's two league games, and and then we've got the summer bash. That you know, funnily enough, we're going to play Jonesbury. You know, I, I know it probably took a lot of, a lot of thinking about how badly we're going to play on the on the on the uh, the summer bash, and funnily enough, we've drawn Jonesbury. Uh, so that's four times this year we would have played. Uh, so say the, the fixtures do get watered down a little bit with, in, in, in respect to the derbies, and I think I think we now need to maybe look at it a little bit less and, and, and try and get the interest back there now. So you, you're not playing each other four times a season, so you, you get the interest back there. And in terms of crowd figure, it's it's pretty much stable, um, and and you know the economics are worked out around that. What what would you like to see it get up to in a, in a realistic sense? I, th- I think I think as a as, as a basis for us to, to to thrive and for us to grow, 
you know, we we don't we don't want to be reliant on on, on the away team supporters. You know, we don't want to be reliant on on Lee, Lee and Featherstone and Bradford and Halifax or whoever else that are coming bringing a lot of supporters to to improve our our games. We we want our our own supporters to get. I suppose we could get above seven fifty a thousand. You know, our supporter base at this moment in time is quite an elderly supporter base. You know, so we need to try and get more people in there. As I said, that's why the club are looking at other things now away from rugby league to try and generate some more income coming into the club. Uh, because if we can't get the get the attendance coming through the gate, we need to generate finances elsewhere. And if we can get people to come to the club in a different guise to the rugby league, but they enjoy what they what they're doing when they come into the club, that might entice them to come to a game. And if we're going to track them to come to a game and they enjoy that, then it, it might mean that they stay and they might, might they might come back more. Uh, I think over the over recent years, with the success that the club's had in 2010, 13, 16, and last year as well, we're doing all we can on the field to try and be successful, but it's not really generated any any great increase in crowds. But again, going back to what I said about teams like York, where they've been really good at promoting the game and getting people in the ground, maybe that's something that we we need to improve and do better. But well, if we've not got the people there that we're employing to get people into the ground and, and focus on that promotion, it's uh, it's something that might not get better. So it's, it's maybe you've got to speculate to accumulate, to spend a bit of money on somebody to try and get the people back into the ground and, and generate that interest and generate them, them attendance is getting, getting up. But, you know, I suppose it's the it's chicken, chicken and egg scenario and you, you spend the money on somebody to try and get people into the, into the ground. If they don't come, then it's money wasted. Uh, but you can't just expect people to turn up because they've not done that for the last 20, 25 years. You've got some political support as well. Um, Kim Ledbetter is a big fan of what you're doing in the community. It fits in with, um, obviously, the Joe Cox Foundation. Uh, is that an area that you think you can um, exploit a little more to the, the benefit of the club? Yeah, potentially. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of, lot of work with, as, as, as a club with Joe Cox, obviously, before... Uh, before what happened to John and then, then with Kim, Kim Sins. Uh, so we've got real good relationships with with, with the family and the, and the Joe Cox Foundation as well. And we do a lot of, a lot of work as a club and, and the foundation of the club as well, do a lot of work with, with, with the Joe Cox Foundation in the community. Um, you know, so if we can try and benefit that by, by again, bringing, bringing some, whether it's interest, whether it's some, uh, uh, some media interest, media support, or whether it's some financial support, if we can, can use that to our advantage, and we will do. Uh, but we think we're certainly not looking for handouts and, and going out with a begging ball. We need to, as a club, be a little bit better at trying to generate that financial income and, and, and the interest in the club as well. Far too much sense for you to book. Um, we Craig, knew that. Well, that's why I invited him. So. Uh, Craig, thank you very much for your time uh, this evening. Best of luck with everything uh, going forward in 2022. Hopefully, uh, a not very disrupted season. Uh, obviously, well, it sounds like you won't be disrupted at least for the first three months, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, more success and building on what you had in uh, 2021. Hopefully, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on.